Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. Together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is February the 26th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and when we were last together, we had finished chapter 5 of Joshua. So we want to pick up today in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now, it says, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. The reputation of the people of Israel had spread throughout the land, and so Jericho knew that God was on their side. And Jericho knew who God was. They knew that their wooden statues, which they considered to be gods, was no match for the true and living God, and that the true and living God was fighting for the people of Israel. So it wasn't so much Israel that they feared, it was the God of Israel that they feared. And so because of this, it was tightly shut up. Nobody went in, nobody came out. Well, in verse 2, it says, Yahweh, the Lord, said unto Joshua, See now, I have given into you the hand of Jericho, and the king of Jericho, and all of its mighty men. In other words, you're going to defeat Jericho. But this is the way that you're going to do it, Joshua, so that I receive all the glory, and you receive none. Israel receives none. And my reputation will continue throughout the land. You will compass the city. All you men of war, and you will go around the city once, and you will do this for six days. Now, in verse 10, it says, Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You will not shout, nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. Absolute silence. Now, this is important to understand for this reason. There are some psychological aspects to what is taking place. You must understand, Jericho is a fortified city. It has large walls around it. There's nothing to indicate that anyone was atop the walls. So we are only left to assume that they are inside the city and their imaginations are running wild. Now, you know how your imagination can run away with you and lead you to hear things in the dark, see pictures in your minds of things that are taking place, when actually it may be nothing more than an old creaking floor or a pet in the house or a mouse or anything else that you really shouldn't be frightened of. But the imagination can create fear, and the more intense the imagination, the more intense the fear. And so we must understand that's what's taking place here. The people of Jericho are on the inside of the city. They can't see what's taking place outside. All they hear is thousands of feet in unison marching around the city. They can't hear anything else. Not a word is being spoken. Only the footsteps that surround the entire city, and then that's the end of the day. The next day they get up, they do the same thing. They do this for six days. Now, you can imagine by the sixth day, the people inside the walls of Jericho are absolutely terrified by what may be taking place on the outside of that wall. And it would seem that this is the very in intent of the Most High. He's beating the people before the first blow is ever struck. M Muhammad Ali was famous for this. He would get in their heads and before the first round of the fight ever began, the enemy was already defeated because they feared Muhammad Ali, what he was capable of doing. And that's exactly what we see taking place in this story. So God says you'll do this for six days. In verse 4, it picks up, it says, Now seven priests will bear before the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the most holy material possession that the children of Israel have in their possession. God himself and all of his power, all of his glory, all of his majesty, all of his might reside within the Ark of the Covenant. And you're going to see in future stories that the supernatural power of the Ark of the Covenant is going to be manifested. 
So seven priests will bear before the ark. They will walk in front of the ark. They will have seven trumpets of ram's horns. And on the seventh day, they're going to compass the city seven times. For the first six days, they're only been circling the city one time. But on the seventh day, they're going to circle once. And the people on the inside are going to be expecting it to stop because that's the way it's been for the last six days. But they're going to go around a second time, a third time. And on the seventh time, all the priests are going to blow as loud as they can their ram's horns, their shafars. And it will come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, that all the people of Israel will shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And so Joshua takes the words of the Lord unto the priest, unto the people, and tells them what they're to do. And it begins in verse 12 and says, Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. Now the seven priests, which bore the seven trumpets of ram's horns or the shafars before the ark of the Lord went on continually and they blew with the trumpets and the armed men went before them. And those in the rear came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. The second day they compassed the city once, returned into the camp. So did they for six days. Now it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day. And they compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now notice this in verse 17 because this is going to be very important for our next story, which we're going to discuss in a moment. The city itself will be accursed. Everything in the city will be considered accursed unto the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. Now you'll recall Rahab. We talked about her last time. She hung the scarlet thread in her window. And, and when they see that scarlet thread, they're going to avoid her house. But everyone else in the city is to be killed. And in verse 18, it says, keep yourselves from taking anything that is within the city. For if you do, you will accurse yourself and you will make the whole camp of Israel a curse. So by your inaction, if you decide to take something, you're going to curse us all as a people. So all the silver, all the gold, all the vessels of brass and iron, these are consecrated unto the Lord. And these will be taken so that we can use them in the treasury of the Lord. In other words, they're storing up all the silver, the gold, the brass for the building of the temple that is to come in time. Well, after encompassing the city, circling the city seven times, Joshua shouts and tells the people that the Lord has given them the city. And in verse 20, it says the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the wall fell down flat so that the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, man, woman, young, old, ox, sheep, ass. They killed everything with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into Rahab, the harlot's house, and bring her out safely, and all who are in the house with her, just as you swore unto her. And the young men did as Joshua had commanded them. They brought Rahab and all her family out to safety. In verse 24, it says, They burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Only the silver, the gold, and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. These were consecrated unto the Lord. No man could keep gold, silver, iron, brass. They could not take it for their own possession. So Joshua had saved Rahab the harlot just as the two spies had swore unto her all of her father's household, and she dwelt in Israel even unto this day, because she had hid the messengers of God, and she had protected them. Now chapter 6 ends by Joshua telling the people, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and builds this city Jericho. 
So the Lord was with Joshua and the people of Israel that day, and his fame, Joshua's fame, who the Lord favored, was noised abroad throughout all the country. You know how fast gossip spreads. Well, these tales were being told throughout all the land. And everyone feared Yahweh and Joshua even more than they had before. But now as chapter 7 begins, notice this. It says, The children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Now notice it says, The children of Israel as a whole had committed a sin against the Most High because they took what they were not supposed to. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So one man offended, and yet God was angry with the whole. It's almost like that old saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so all the people are going to be punished because of what one man has done. Well, now Joshua, just coming off of this victory of Jericho, sent men from Jericho to Ai, and he told them to go view the country, spy it out. Well, they returned to Joshua, and they said unto him, We don't even have to send everyone up. Let only two or 3,000 men go up to fight them, for they are small in number, they're weak in power, and there's nothing for us to be afraid of. Well, in verse 4, it says about 3,000 men went up, but they fled before the man of Ai. Why? Well, as you're going to see, God isn't fighting for them. So what they considered to be weak and powerless now is defeating them. And this shows us that man on his own is limited. But when we have God on our sides, hallelujah, we are victorious and to fear nothing. Well, the men of Ai smote them, about 36 men, and they chased the children of Israel, and they were killing them as they were chasing them. And so the hearts of the people of Israel melted. They became fearful. And Joshua, having just suffered this defeat, rent his clothes, fell to the earth upon his face, and said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought these people over Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites. We would have been better off on the other side of the Jordan. All the people of the land of Canaan are going to hear about this defeat. And this is going to embolden them against us. So as we move across the land and we try to take these places for the Lord, they're going to fight us harder because if AI can defeat us, surely they can as well. And they will defeat us. They will kill us and cut our names from the earth. And by destroying us, what will that do unto your great name, O God? And listen to what the Lord says in verse 10. Get thee up. Quit acting like a baby. Use some common sense. If I was with you, when you defeated Jericho and you've been defeated by Ai, what does this tell you? Well, the obvious answer would be that I am not with you. And so if I am not with you, why is it that I am not with you? And he answers that in verse 11. He says, Israel has sinned. Now, he doesn't say Achan. And it is Achan that's the perpetrator of this sin. But he says, Israel has sinned. And they've transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken the accursed thing, and they're hiding it among their own stuff. This is why the children of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. And until you correct this matter, Joshua, I will not be with you anymore. So up with yourself. Stop wallowing in your pity. Sanctify the people, and in the morning bring forth the tribes. And I, the Lord, will reveal to you which tribe is guilty. From the tribes bring the families, and I will reveal to you which family is guilty. From the families bring the households, and I will reveal to you which household is guilty. And from the household bring each man, and I will reveal you to which man is guilty. And in verse 15, it will be that he that is taken with the accursed thing, he will be burnt with fire and everything that he has. 
because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And so Joshua rose up in the morning and he did just what the Lord had commanded them. He worked his way through the tribes and found out that it was the tribe of Judah. He worked his way through the families and he found that it was the family of the Zarhites. He worked his way through the households and found that it was the household of Zabdi. And as he worked his way through the household in verse 18, he found that the guilty party was Achan. And so Joshua said to Achan in verse 19, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him. Tell me now what you have done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. You see, that's where the sin is. The sin isn't necessarily in that he took them. It's that the desire in his heart was corrupt and evil. And this is why this man must be destroyed because his heart is corrupt. And we have to remember what the New Testament tells us, a little leaven will destroy the whole lump. And so if this seed of poison is allowed to survive within the people of Israel, his corrupt seed will spill over into the lives of others and corrupt them as well. And this is why we read in Matthew chapter 18 about what we're supposed to do in enacting church discipline. Because we are to always remember a little leaven will destroy the entire lump. A drop of poison will destroy a whole vat of water. And that's the idea here. So the problem is Achan, who has a corrupt heart, therefore he must be eliminated from the people of God. Well, Achan continues and says, because I coveted them, I took them. Now in the book of James, we are told that sin is a threefold process. It begins with a thought, it's created into a plan, and then it becomes an action. And all sin is manifested this way. And that's what Achan is confirming here. He said, I coveted it, I devised a plan, because after he took it, then he hid it under his tent, thinking no one would know. And then he acted it out by actually taking it and hiding it under his tent. Well, in verse 22, Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent. And it was hid in his tent, just as he had said, and the silver under it. And so notice what his punishment is. It says in verse 24 that Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver that he had stolen, the garment that he had stolen, the wedge of gold that he had stolen, all of Achan's sons, all of his daughters, all of his oxen, all of his asses, all of his sheep, all of his tent, everything that he had, and they brought them into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? For we lost many men today in a battle against Ai, and all their blood is to be upon your hands, Achan. And so all Israel stoned Achan with stones and burned them with fire. Notice them. It says they stoned Achan or him with stones but they burned them with fire. Well, what would be them? Them would be the silver, the gold, the garment, the sons, the daughters, the oxen, the asses, the sheep, everything that Achan had after they had stoned them with stones. So Achan is stoned with stones. Everything that belongs to him is stoned with stones. And then they're all set up on fire. And they raised over them a great heap of stones unto this day as a monument, as a reminder of what happens to an individual when they're disobedient unto God. This would be what's known as today as capital punishment. And regardless whether you believe in capital punishment or not, you have to be willing to admit the fact that if capital punishment were enforced, crime would be a lot less. I mean, do you honestly think if people were walking around with one less hand that we would have as many shoplifters in Walmart? Do you think that there would be as many rapes if people were castrated for being found guilty of the act? Of course not. It wouldn't entirely eliminate the problem of sin because only God himself can do that through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But it would lower the number substantially and anyone in their right mind using any kind of common sense would have to admit that that would be true. 
Well, it finishes, chapter 7 finishes by saying, now because the sin had been dealt with, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. His blessing was once again upon the people as they move throughout the land of Canaan and they continue in their fight to take the land for themselves. And so the name of the place where this took place is called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Now, the lesson that we take from our story today is quite simple, to be honest. First of all, it is a lesson of obedience. When God has commanded us, we're expected to be obedient to what he has commanded us. And the second lesson would be this, that when we do behave in disobedient ways, we must be very careful not to deceive ourselves into thinking that these things are secret and somehow God hasn't seen our injustice our disobedience. The Bible tells us that God is aware of everything at all times. Jesus himself said we will be held accountable for every word spoken. Matter of fact, he said every idle word. Idle words would be words like thee and we, but and and. How much more will we be accountable for the obvious words of defamation to his character, to his will, naughty words, filthy words, lying words, words of cursing, gossip, and slander. But Jesus said, every idle word we will be held accountable for. And this tells us that he is aware of everything we are doing at all times, even the things that we think are secret and no one else knows. He knows. He reads our hearts. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. He knows every attitude. He knows every feeling. And so what we learn from this story today is there are consequences. Consequences in this life and consequences in the life to come. You see, we don't know. It is possible. I mean, the Bible tells us to lay up treasure in heaven. And so we could assume that we have spent let's just say the last week in laying up treasures in heaven and in one moment by one simple act of disobedience, we could lose all the treasure that we have laid up before. And what if when we get there and the Lord does bestow treasure and reward upon us and yet he says, if you had only been more faithful, if you had only been more obedient, if you would have only been more observant to my will throughout your life, this is what could have been yours. And in magnitude, what we could have had would have been a hundred times more than what we received. Now, I'm not insinuating that our focus is to be upon our reward because you know how I feel about that. But if when we get there and we do receive reward and we're grateful for what the Lord is doing for us because of what we have done for him. And yet he does show us in comparison all that we have lost. I think in and of itself, that could be a form of punishment. And so we must understand that there are consequences to our sin. And when sin does approach us, when it does tempt us and temporarily blind us to the truth, we must have trained ourselves well in reminding ourselves of our relationship with God, of our love to him, and of the consequences that will follow if we're disobedient to him, to his commandments. And that's why it's so important we get the word of God in us every day, because the more word in us, the less likely we are to sin, the less likely we are to disobey. I know this by experience, and I'm sure that you do too. I can look back on times when I fell into sin, when I backslid against my Lord. And I know that the first indication of that process was I got myself out of the word. There was less of the word and more of me, less of the word and more of the world, less of the word and more of self. And that never has a good outcome, friends. So if we want to eliminate the possibilities of these acts of disobedience in our lives, we simply must fill ourselves with the living, all-powerful, life-transforming Word of God. Hallelujah, friends. Hallelujah. I love the Word of God. I'm sure that you do too. Well, I'm so thankful again that you're with us this morning. I pray that you have learned something from these two stories 
And I pray that that's something that you have learned will motivate you so that you will be a more faithful follower of the Lord Jesus in everything that you say, everything that you think, and everything that you do. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.